When I was born, my parents passed some stuff down to me. Bad genes, chronic depression, and Detroit Lions fandom. My entire life has been one of the following stories with the Lions. A team with a ton of talent but not able to put it all together. A terrible team that makes it hard to even watch. Or once in a generation talent that is wasted. I mean completely wasted. For an entire career. Oh, and also an ownership team that pisses off those once in a generation talents and makes them hate them. That seems pretty smart. I remember being a young lad going to my first Lions game with my dad. Having good 50 yard line seats seeing Barry Sanders walk along the sideline. Man short in stature compared to other pros, but a man that was bigger than life itself. Every time he touched the ball, the crowd held its breath, as everyone in the building knew something magical could happen at any time. But Barry was it. Everything started and ended with Barry Sanders. It turned into Barry being a one-man show, a workhorse on an organization that sucked the fun out of the sport of football. The Detroit Lions. This is a story everyone knows though, and one that's been told over and over again. Barry Sanders era. After his retirement though is when the depression really sets in. When Barry left the team and retired from football, the entire state of Michigan went with it. We all knew without Barry, it was going to be sad days ahead for all of us. While a good effort was made in the 1999 and 2000 seasons, with the Lions sneaking into the playoffs in 1999 with an 8-8 record, the blow-up of the team was inevitable. And that blow-up happened after the 2000 season, and from 2001 to 2006, the Lions were almost unbearably bad to watch. Plagued by a coaching staff that just couldn't grasp a hold of the roster, to a front office making some mind-bogglingly bad decisions with the roster and draft capital that it had. Mike Williams, anyone? Out of football for a year and 50 pounds of weight put on? Let's draft him at 10. Charles Rogers was a pretty good second overall pick as well. That worked out. Or how about Roy Williams at seven? Three straight drafts. The Lions had all of this draft capital after bad seasons with early picks and three straight years they drafted a wide receiver that never came to fruition. The Matt Millen era in a nutshell. What a time that was. And in 2007, it happened all over again. The Lions, two years removed from drafting wide receiver, with the first round pick three straight years, took another wide receiver. But this time, the man they took was a freak of nature. A six foot five, 230 pound wide out who could run a 4-3-40 and jump right out of the building. That man's name is Calvin Johnson. Hall of Famer, Calvin Johnson. Someone who would go on to be one of the most dominant forces not only at his position, but in the entire NFL. But he was one man. The Lions had a long way to go, but it was on the up and up. Seven game win season, some big wins during the year, and a good nucleus built up within the team. An improvement was expected by all Lions fans going into the 2008 season. Little did we know, an improvement was not on the slate of fate for the Detroit Lions. Instead, we were given the second greatest show on turf. That show was loading up a game every week to see if the Lions were not going to be the first team in NFL history to go 0-16. In case you aren't up to date on Lions history, they went 0-16. This season, while fun for a lot looking in watching, for Lions fans it really was signs of what team we were going to have for a long time in the future. But hey, I guess there were a ton of cool highlights from this season. Like, did you know Matt Ryan's first career pass was against the Lions? And it was for a TD? Or how about Turner breaking the Atlanta Falcons franchise record for rushing yards in this game as well? Or how about this highlight that everybody likes to laugh at? Santana Moss's putt return after running into his own teammate was pretty fun. Man, looking back at this year, the Lions really liked giving up punt returns for touchdowns. The one thing people like to forget is Dante Culpepper was on this team, even though it didn't really quite go good for him. After the 2008 season, this was the lowest it could get though. There was only one place to go, and that was up. And so, with the first pick solidified, the Lions couldn't mess this one up. We needed a strong signal caller. Culpepper and Kitna were not going to cut it anymore, throwing to the up-and-coming Calvin Johnson. So with the first pick, the Detroit Lions selected a big-arm gunslinger in Matthew Stafford out of Georgia. A man who could stretch the field, slinging 60-yard bombs with ease. 
After a minicamp battle, Stafford won the job over Culpepper and was the starting quarterback for the Detroit Lions' future. Even though he had a slow showing in his first career game, as most rookies do, you could see that he could be a solid future for the Detroit Lions. And most of his rookie campaign was just that. Flashes of brilliance mirrored with rookie mistakes and tons of force passes. He was the gunslinger. That is what the Detroit fans called him and a title that would stick with him throughout his entirety here at Detroit. Man with one of the biggest arms in the NFL, he had a ton of upside and had already shown that he loved the city of Detroit, the state of Michigan, and Detroit Lions football. And then November 22nd came. Playing the Cleveland Browns, the Detroit Lions were down big in the first quarter, 24-3. But Matthew Stafford showed his will to lead the team and his skill at the quarterback position giving the Lions three consecutive TD passes. One, a 75-yard catch and run to Calvin Johnson. But this isn't what this game is known for. This game is known for one drive. One drive that Stafford would be known for for his entire career. A mentality that Stafford is known for and will be known for into the future as well. Fourth quarter comeback drives. But this isn't just about the comeback drive. On this day, he showed Lions fans something else. He showed that he'll battle to the end for this team. He'll play through whatever pain he has and do whatever he can to win a game. On a sequence of plays that would become synonymous with Matthew Stafford, Stafford, with a separated shoulder, showed what kind of quarterback he was going to be. After a couple more starts, playing through multiple injuries though this year, Stafford was eventually placed on IR. And that was it. The season that had been over for a couple of weeks now had reached its finality. And me, along with so many other fans, began what would become a Lions fandom tradition. Looking to next year, halfway through the season. What draft position will we get? What signings will happen? Where does the team go from here? And heading into the 2010 season, the Lions actually made some great moves. They brought in Nate Burleson to complement Calvin Johnson. Veterans Sean Hill and KVB Kyle Vandenbosch were brought in along with drafting the interior menace, and Dominican Sue. All these pieces would pay dividends for the Lions in the future. Matthew Stafford is healthy, and hopes are high with the Lions fan base. All the moves they made, the Stafford to Calvin Johnson connection, a bolstered defense, big things were to come in the eyes of Lions fans. But as with everything while rooting for the Lions, Stafford again takes a big hit, his right shoulder, throwing arm now hurt, and he's out for half the season. The Lions were back to the same old Lions yet again. And even though Stafford came back halfway through the season, he ended up re-injuring the shoulder, had surgery, and was placed on IR for the second straight season since being drafted by the Detroit Lions. And this is where Stafford got his injury-prone status, something that has lived with him for his entire career, even though he has proved that to be inaccurate. You'll still see people use that as a detriment to his ability, and trust me, Lions fans were thinking the same thing after two seasons of injuries. But heading into the 2011 season, something looked different with Stafford. He looked more fit, put on a ton of muscle, he built his body up, and that would be a huge key in his Iron Man run of more than eight and a half years. The fluke injuries were over. Matthew Stafford was ready to ball out and show that he was the quarterback of the Detroit Lions. And ball out he did. 5,038 yards, the fourth player to ever throw over 5,000 yards in the season, 41 TDs, 10 and 6 record, and the Lions' first playoff berth since the 1999 season. Matthew Stafford and the Detroit Lions brought back that stupid four-letter word into the Lions fans' minds, hope. Maybe the Lions will finally see a playoff win, something that has eluded them for two decades. But Detroit Lions fans should be used to this by now. Whenever that four-letter word creeps into our mind, you need to suppress it. Push it down, out of mind. Because that hope will only be ripped away from you. Going up against a Drew Brees-led Saints team, two late-inning picks would seal the Lions' 2011 season, with the Saints knocking them off 45-28. A season of high hopes, crashing down in a late-game blowout loss. But the pieces were set. We had a big season for the Lions. A playoff berth, finally. 
all of us ready to see what improvements they make heading into the 2012 season. We all had a lot of hope, and we're ready to take the next step. 4 and 12, 7 and 9, Schwartz is fired. Oh, what the hell? The same old Lions were back. Schwartz was out the door, and the next era was upon us. The Jim Caldwell era. One that was filled with mediocrity, but mediocrity that led to fun Detroit Lions football. And the best stretch of football that the Lions have seen since the 90s. The culture in the building was starting to turn around, and the Lions looked like they were just waiting for the breakout. Three out of the four seasons over 500, two playoff berths, and one season where we should have won a playoff game, uh, but the refs have been screwing over the Lions for 50 years, so why would that stop now? Matthew Stafford and the offense looked great throughout this stretch. The defense was in top form, sporting a top five defense one of the years. And overall, the Lions seemed to be having fun and buying into the system that Jim Caldwell and the veterans of the team put in place. Even though the Lions were barely making it into the playoffs, they were still in the playoffs. Once there, anything can happen in the NFL. A team can always get hot and make a run. Being in the hunt every season was something Lions fans hadn't had in a long time and something young Lions fans had never had. This had all Lions fans, including myself, optimistic about the team and where it was heading for the first time in a long time for an extended period of time. Even though some bumps occurred along the way, including the retirement of Calvin Johnson and his estrangement from the team that drafted him due to inept ownership, excitement was high. While the Calvin retirement really struck at the hearts of Lions fans, most knew why. Injuries, a general plate of mediocrity, and the fun of football sucked out of another once-in-a-generational talent by the Detroit Lions. It is a story we have all heard before. But all the pieces were still there, and the Lions were in the hunt for another playoff berth. Like most things that the Detroit Lions touched though, it all went to hell. Spurred by a Lions fan base, one that looked at our roster and thought that 9-7 wasn't good enough, that two playoff berths and a winning record over four years wasn't shiny enough, and an ownership and front office team that wanted a Super Bowl team decided Caldwell wasn't good enough. And after a 9-7 season with a missed playoff berth, the Lions fired Coach Jim Caldwell. He changed the culture. He had everyone bought in. He had the team winning. But it just wasn't good enough. Now, I am guilty of this too. We were winning, but I wanted more. All of my friends wanted more. The city wanted more. We all thought we just needed a coach to carry us the extra little bit and take us deep into the playoffs. Now, hindsight 2020, this was probably the worst hire the Lions could have made. Jim Caldwell was a player's coach. While he might not have had the fire that a lot of the fans wanted to see, he got the players to play for. Matt Patricia now, Matt Patricia was not Jim Caldwell. And while at first that seemed like a great thing, it showed to be detrimental to everything that had been built up for the past five years. We should have all seen it in the first two months Patricia was in town. This is a Lions team that was coming off of nine and seven and just barely missing the playoffs. A lot of work had to be done? What are you talking about? But no one blinked an eye. We believed him, and we believed in him. But in only his first year, halfway through the season, it was reported that Patricia had lost the locker room. The veterans didn't like him. The players led by the veterans followed suit. You could see it on the field. The players just didn't want to play for Matt Patricia. Patricia wanted to instill the Patriot way into the locker room when he hadn't won a damn thing in his career. I can't even count on two hands how many times Patricia brought up how he coached the Patriots' greatest defensive play in Super Bowl history. Who cares? What have you done as a head coach? The answer was nothing. He was a maniacal coach, bad player caller, terrible press face, once yelling at a reporter for slouching during a press conference. Yeah, do me a favor, just kind of sit up and just like have a little respect for the process. Every day you come in and ask me questions and you just kind of like, you know, give me this. But I mean, like, just, just be a little respectful. And he beat down players where none of them wanted to play for. All the talent that the Lions had built up wanted out, including one of my favorite defensive players on the team and maybe one of my favorite defensive players for the Lions ever, Darius Slay, who later talked about how Patricia belittled him and made him feel inferior to the rest of the league when he was someone who was at the top of his game at corner. All that talent that we had built up over the past five years, though, gone. Eric Ebron, Nada, Whitehead, 
Glover Quinn, retired. TJ Lang, retired. Zeke Lanza, Harrison, Wagner, Glasgow, Ashawn Robinson, Darius Slay, Quandre Diggs, and finally, this past offseason, Matthew Stafford. All gone. In three years, Patricia had successfully turned a perennial in the hunt team into the same old Lions. So much so that this past offseason, Matthew Stafford, after being the general, living and breathing Detroit football, demanded a trade on the cusp of yet another coaching turnover. Thankfully for the Lions, they obliged. And while it hurt to see the Lions waste another great talent in Matthew Stafford, I truly hope the Rams can give him what the Lions never did, an actual shot at a Super Bowl. So here we are, at the current road of the Lions' 20 years of sadness. A new coaching staff, one that on paper is the best the Lions have ever assembled, draft capital for the next couple of years, and lots of question marks. This is a big year for the Lions, and one that will show the direction this team will take under Dan Campbell. What will the team look like in five years? Will Campbell be able to bring his energy and players coach mentality in to turn around the culture of the Detroit Lions? Only time will tell. My parents passed on Lions fandom to me. And while I hate them a lot of the time, a Lions fan for life I will be. Thanks for watching.